Well, we're so glad that you're joining us today. We're going to sing of his faithfulness as we get started here. Just close your eyes with me. Lord, you're so worthy. You're so faithful. Would you just fix our eyes, our heart on you right now? That we could search and search and search for fulfillment, for satisfaction, but it's all found in you, Jesus. Hmm, we just thank you that you can take the ashes of this world and you can change them into beauty, the ashes of our life. We thank you that that's what you do. Hmm. Thank you that there's nothing that compares to you, Jesus. As we sing to you today, we just ask that you be glorified as we lift you high. We love you in Jesus' name. Let's worship him together. And I'll search the world And it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures of faith Are never enough <laughs> You came along And put me back together Satisfied here in love, so true. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Sing it to him. Better than you. Oh, there's nothing, and nothing is better than you. Sing that to him. Oh, there's. nothing better, nothing that satisfies, nothing that this world has to offer. Hmm. Jesus, we just thank you. Hmm. There's no fear in you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. Of failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me God of the mountain, the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace can't find me again. Hallelujah. Oh, there's nothing, sing it to him, better than you, oh, there's nothing, better than you. And nothing is better than you. Oh, we sing it to you, Jesus. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. And nothing is better than you. Yes, Lord. You turn morning to day. You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Declare that. You're the only one who can. Always oh, sing to you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Nothing is better than you. 
of singing to him oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing and nothing is better than you just take a minute and just thank him from your own heart oh jesus Forgive us where we've turned. That's not to you. Things that are empty, things that are counterfeit, looking for them to fulfill us, satisfy us. We just want to run to you, Jesus. Because you're faithful, your promises are true. That we will find our rest, our portion, our satisfaction in you just lean on you, not in our own ways, but in your wisdom and your understanding. Thank you for your faithfulness. Hmm. This song is called Promises. If it's familiar to you, awesome. Sing along right where you are if you're watching this from home. If not, just think about these words, just about his great faithfulness, how he's been faithful age to age, endlessly faithful to you faithful to his creation, faithful to his word, faithful to his promises. Lord, help us to really dig in and know what your promises are for us. How can we know if you're faithful if we don't even know what your promises are? We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you. Yes, Lord. You're the God of Abraham. You're the God of covenant, your faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass. What word are you waiting to see come to pass today? <laughs> Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the same to me. 
From the rising and sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Yes, Lord. I put my faith in Jesus. My faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. Lord, we just thank you. Just close your eyes and just pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Your promises are true, Lord. We just ask right now that as we dig into your word, you would keep our hearts open, ready to receive. You are our shelter, Lord, the one we run to. You are faithful and trustworthy, and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, you have one minute. Get your Bible out, fill up your coffee, and we'll meet you right back here. Hello, happy Sunday to you. I'm so glad that you're joining us today on the live stream. Today we're going to start a really fun journey together, a journey through Psalms 90, so I almost said Psalms 91 because we've spent a lot of time there, but Psalms 90. We're going to go on a journey through Psalms 90. So if you have your Bible with you, let's open it up and turn to Psalms 90. While you're turning to Psalms 90, I want to ask you really quick, if you're part of our local tribe fam community, well, even our extended community, um, it, the way that we keep in touch with you throughout the week, not to 
fill your cell phone with all kinds of text messages because you're inundated enough with information, but we send out a tribe text blast. And on New Year's Day, I send out a tribe text blast with a link to a podcast by a guy named Corey Russell from the Upper Room Dallas Church that's run by Michael Miller there right in the greater Dallas area. And Corey Russell preached a great message. This was about November of 2021, so just this fall. But I've, I listened to it once, and I listened to it again and again, and I, I felt so strongly that Corey Russell was saying what we have been talking about for a year, almost two years, and it's so cool to see how Senior Pastor Jesus is touching the heart of so many churches around the world with the same Maranatha message. So if you have not had a chance to listen to that podcast, make sure you go back and listen to it. And if you don't get our text blast, just send us an email. Uh, our information, uh, contact information, email is on the website, and we'll make sure to get that podcast to you because it's so good. I really would like every single one of our Tribe Fam members to listen to that podcast, all right? Okay, so you've had enough time to turn to Psalms 90. I'm going to go ahead and read all of Psalms 90. It's not that long. It's not like we're reading Psalms 119, <laughs> Bible joke. But I'm going to read uh, all of these verses to you, and you can follow along in your Bible. And let's read this together. Psalms 90. Lord, through all the generate, and I'm getting to be that age. Uh, Lord, what? It's all right. It's all right. Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, you gave birth to the earth and the world. From the beginning to end, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. For you, a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear. They are like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blossoms and flourishes, but by evening it's dry and withered. We wither beneath your anger. You are overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, and you see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath, ending our years with a groan. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. This is a great song, right? Don't worry, don't worry. Who can compare, who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. O oh Lord, come back to us. Man, if that's not the Maranatha cry in the Old Testament, I don't know what is. Maranatha means he has come and he's coming again, so come, Lord Jesus. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love, so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see you work again. Let your children see your glory. And may the Lord, our God, show us his approval. Make all of our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. There's so much to unpack in this one psalm. On one hand, it kind of sounds like many songs here in the book of Psalms. There are a lot of themes that are repeated over and over, not only within this psalm, but throughout this entire amazing book of the Bible. But on the other hand, there's some very unique and wonderful truths for us today to pull out of this one psalm. So we're going to take just a, a few weeks and we're going to look at Psalms 90 all together. We're going to break it down and you're going to get to hear from other members of our leadership team, which I'm really excited for. But today... I'm going to take you through the introduction 
and give you an overview of this psalm, and then we're just going to look at verse 1 and 2 together. All right, does that sound good? Yeah. Woohoo! Give your neighbor on the couch next to you a high five. There we go. We added that sound effect in real time. I'm so glad that we have our tribe fam joining us. Um, the, the Baxters that are joining us, the North of Towners, the West Bankers, Bob and Janet, uh, our tribe family down in Bondurant, Arizona, Germany, Bahamas, Hillary watching in Colorado, always so faithful, Susan that checks in from Israel, anybody that might be trapped over the hill on the other side of the pass in the Victor Driggs area, and in this place, or any other parallel galaxy, I'm so glad that you're part of the live stream with us today. Let's look at Psalms 90. Now, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but right off the bat, there's a very interesting detail, something very unique about this psalm. Can you see it? I remember years ago, Lissa and I, before we had kids, we were on a trip to Costa Rica and we're like, hey, let's do one of these like uh, uh, like river sightseeing tours with like alligators and stuff. Alligators or crocodiles? Eh, alligators. Alligators. And the lady who spoke English as her second language, she would point out all kinds of really cool wildlife. But instead of saying, can you see that bird over there? Can you see that lizard or whatever it was? She would always say, can you watch him? So we say that as a part of our family. Can you, watch, can you watch him? Can you watch him and see the unique detail right at the beginning of Psalms 90? I know you see it. Who wrote Psalms 90? Usually we plunge headlong into these Psalms imagining that it was David. But no, no, no. Can you watch him? Look who wrote Psalms 90. A prayer of Moses. This is a unique song because it's in the book of Psalms, but it's written by Moses. Now, lots of biblical scholars think about uh, when this was written, if it was even written by Moses at all, but maybe it was just attributed to him. Ah, let's throw in uh, this song. I don't know who wrote it. Ah, let's give, let's give credit to Moses. I do not believe that the Bible is haphazard, nor the writers and organizers of the Bible was that haphazard at all. If it says that this was a song of Moses, it's a song of Moses. So now, when was this song written? Some scholars believe that it was written during Babylonian exile. Well, that's impossible because that was hundreds of years after the life of Moses. So I don't believe it was written then. It was written sometime within the lifetime of Moses. Was it written during the 40 years of wandering through the desert? Perhaps. Was it written in the first 40 years of his life living in Egypt? Probably not, because you can see the, the, the pain and the hardship, the, the gritty rawness that doesn't usually come out in comfortable places like palaces, but more comes out in uncomfortable places like a desert. I tend to think as I read this, that this verse, this prose that Moses wrote, was written after he was 40 years old, when he left Egypt, remember, he fled Egypt after killing an Egyptian. Remember, the Bible talks about, right here in Psalms, you spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, those sins that might be buried or hidden, like an Egyptian that you murdered underneath the desert sand. Perhaps. So that's when I think that Moses wrote this, was in his... He turned about, it was about 40, and then uh, from 40 to 80, he spent wandering, not wandering in the desert, but living in the desert. The Bible talks about the backside of the desert. If desert is a remote and desolate enough place, this says that Moses was on the backside of the desert. And I believe it, I believe just personally that during those 40 years, trying to figure out who he was, uh, he had been taken from his family, his birth family. 
raised in the house of Pharaoh, learning all of the wisdom and religion and science of the Egyptians, but yet having this tie to his Hebrew roots because of the close relationship that he had with his mother and his sisters. And so imagine the family that he was born to uh, had to send him away. The family that raised him, he fled from. He's in a foreign place and, and alone with his thoughts, thinking, man, I know that this God has something for me, but, but I've, got, I, I've messed up. I've blown it. These secret sins are just laid before you. My time is ebbing away. Here he is close to 80 years old thinking that, well, my life is just like a blade of grass that grows up and then it dies and withers and is gone. My life is so short. You can see these sort of themes rumbling around in Moses and erupts, comes out in the form of prose that he wrote that finds its way into the book of Psalms. Now this song, Psalms 90, is... Uh, sung at different parts of the Hebrew liturgical calendar, but it's also a part of a regular Shabbat um, uh, service that families might have in their home. So this psalm, there's so much to it, and today we're only going to get into verse 1 and 2, all right? So let's look at verse 1 and 2. Lord, throughout all of the generations... You have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from the beginning to the end, you are God. As I read this, these two verses, there are three themes that I see coming out of these first two verses, and I want to share them with you briefly. The first one is this idea of refuge. Wherever you are, discipleship campus, or if you're watching alone by yourself today, say that word, refuge. Say it. Refuge. Refuge. (laughs) Very good. Reminds me of that Bob Dylan song that always reminds me of Lissy. Come here and I'll give you. Come here. Come in, she said, and I'll give you shelter from the storm. God is our refuge. Can you see that theme coming through in verse 1 and 2? Again, think about Moses looking for some type of relief or refuge from the hot burning sun, all alone, no family, no direction, the sun beating down on him. Maybe he's he's a shepherd, he's taking care of livestock, and he's like, I need some refuge. Reminds me of Psalm 71, verse 3. Be my rock of safety where I can always hide. Give the order to save me, for you are my rock and you are my fortress. Now this word refuge, I do not want you to make a mental connection. Here I am going to tell you, but don't do this. Don't make the mental connection between refuge and escape. Refuge is not escape. Wouldn't it be great if we could just escape? Just get plucked out. How many times do you think Moses in those 40 years of living once like a prince, now like a, a Bedouin desert pauper, wished that he could escape? his current predicament and current reality. But throughout the Bible, and part of God's nature and character we see throughout the Bible, is that he doesn't just help us to uh, escape, but in the midst of storms, in the midst of burning heat, he gives us refuge. Think about this. When you see this, when you see this word, refuge, I want you to think about, if you live here locally, think about uh, the, the feed grounds here or just north of town, the National Elk Refuge. Every winter on the migratory route of elk, 
They come down through Jackson Hole. They usually get stuck in Jackson Hole about winter time. And the National Elk Refuge was established to protect thousands of acres to be able to be a refuge for elk where they can winter here in Jackson Hole and sometimes they're fed and uh, to, to get them through the winter. And then as the winter snow melts, they continue on their migration route back up north through the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So think about what a refuge is not in terms if you are an Elkie, okay? If you're an Elkie, refuge is not a warm cabin with a fire and lots of hot choco, hot choco, hot chocolate or hot cocoa, where you can kick your little hooves up by the fire and pull your blanket up and you just escape the brutality of the winter that's happening around you. That's not what the National Elk Refuge is. The Elk Refuge is still cold. The snow still falls. The wind still blows. But it is a place in the midst of the harshness of life that these elk can come and find a, a modicum of refuge, protection from everything else that's going on around. And so that's what I want you to think of with a refuge. Not that God... Um, he's, he can only go so far to be able to provide aid, assistance, and, 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 and comfort for a person. Yeah, but that's as far as he goes. But here's part of God's nature and character, is that he'll give us refuge in the midst of this storm. Throughout all of the generations, think of all that has happened. The Bible says here, throughout all of the generations, this idea of all the generations includes all that has happened throughout the generations. Noah and the flood and armies and the, the persecution and drought and now bondage and slavery for 400 years, the nation of Israel in captivity in Egypt. Throughout all of the generations, not just your grandpa and your grandpa's 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 grandpa, not just the lineage of people, but the unfolding of human events and how much brokenness there is throughout the world. God, you have been our refuge. It's what is coming up and out of Moses' heart. So not only do I see the theme of refuge in verse 1 and 2, but I also see the theme of relationship. Refuge and relationship. Verse 1 says, Lord, through all the generations you have been our... Isn't that interesting? Of all the things that he could have filled in the blank with, you have been, you have been uh, our protector. You've been the one that comes through. You have been mighty. You have been sovereign. But he chooses to use the word home. Throughout all of the generations, you have been our home. Ah, just really quickly, let me say this. Um, in 20, I don't have it. Oh, yes, I do. If my pants sound crinkly, it's because I have my shell pants on today. Why? Oh, no, no reason. <laughs> this thing, oh man. So many people look to this as their escape doesn't provide any refuge but they look for it as their escape so many people look to this device and i'm preaching to myself right now for some type of relationship not that you have a relationship through this thing or or, or with this thing but looking to meet that need of of connection and community to feel a part of something and and there are certainly there there are um, apps available that that help friends and family and things people stay connected. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, a desire to fill a need that that this thing or any of its applications don't have the capacity to fill. But we just keep coming back to it, like dying of thirst and drinking salt water. It will kill you. From generations to generations, you, God, have been our home, that place that we come back to again and again where there is safety, where there is refuge. Well, here's what's really cool about this word home. 
When you look at this word home in the Hebrew, it does mean a, a, a dwelling or um, like a, a physical structure, but way more than that. It means this idea, uh, it, has, it, it has far less to do with a geographical fixed location and way more to do about the idea of a relationship. So when you see that word home written in your Bible, in this verse, underline that and out in the margin, draw an arrow to it and put relationship. God, throughout all the generations, you have been that place, not geographical, but you have been that place where I can come and have relationship with you. And the Hebrew meaning goes even deeper to mean the kind of relationship, not that friends have, not that teammates have, not that employers and employees have, not the kind of relationship that that close friends or brothers or sisters have, the kind of relationship that exists between a man and a woman. That level of intimacy is what's implied in this word home. Throughout all the generations, you, not a, not a tent, not a job, not a device, not a human relationship, but you, Father God, the creator of heaven and earth, have been our home, that place of deep, intimate relationship that is intended for only, that is reserved for only a husband and wife. How amazing is that? Think about what Noah, Noah, think about what Moses was going through. He's left his ancestral cultural home of his family. He has no home or place in even the the richest palace of the greatest superpower of the world at the time, being in Egypt. He's essentially homeless out on the backside of the desert. And it's out of that place where he has nothing, where he says, God, you are my home. Maybe you find yourself in a season right now where it seems those things that are most comfortable and most familiar to you have been yanked away or are crumbling or crumbling around you or going through difficulty all around you, you can remember not only is God your refuge to, to give you strength and support in the midst of difficulty and opposition, but he is also your home where you can have relationship with him regardless of where you find yourself. That's some really good news. Here's the last thing. Not only is the theme of refuge and relationship in these two verses, but I also see this concept of restoration. Before you gave birth to the earth and the world from the beginning, you are God. I see this context of in the midst of when we come to him for refuge, we find relationship. As we develop a relationship with God, a byproduct of that is restoration. Now, restorate the theme of restoration, you're going to have to look through several more of these verses because isn't it interesting? It's almost like a paradox that we can call, that we can find refuge in him that we can find deep, intimate relationship with him. But yet at the same time, Moses is also talking about the fury of God and how our sins are laid bare before him and the, the, the righteous anger of God expressed towards our sin. How are we supposed... Ah, that's one of the beautiful dynamics of God is that when we come to him, we find refuge with him and in that place of refuge we get to develop a relationship with him and part of that relationship includes restoration look at proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 the name of the lord is a strong fortress the godly run to him and are safe 
That word safe in the Hebrew is a really interesting word. I know that we didn't have time to, to turn there, and I'm going to land the plane with this. Proverbs 18, just write it down in your notes, 18 verse 10, that word safe is a really beautiful word because it does mean protection from, but it also includes with it this idea of being lifted up and above, to be elevated to a place of strength that only happens in the context of experiencing restoration. God loves to take people that have no sense of, of belonging because they've left their family, been ejected from their family. They find themselves in the midst of a wilderness, dragging with them a weight of their past, and God scoops them up. He gives them refuge. He releases to him the context of relationship. And then as a byproduct, they can experience this beautiful restoration. So we're going to see, we're going to see more themes throughout Psalms 90. But I just wanted to give you uh, an introduction and an overview to all of Psalms 90. Just focus on these two verses. But would you do with this with me as Lissa comes to the keyboard? Would you just close your eyes for a moment? And let's invite the presence of the Lord to come to us and meet us where we're at today. Maybe you find yourself in a place where you need refuge. Like that Bob Dylan lyrics, come in, she said, and I'll give you shelter from the storm. Maybe you find yourself feeling far and distant from God. And you need that relationship. He's there. Maybe as you come close, you see that your sins are laid bare before him. Nothing is hidden from him. And you, in your deepest heart of hearts, you're looking for restoration. All three are available. All three are available to you today. Let's just close our eyes and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. good to us there's such riches available to us that that are open wide to enter into a new depth of relationship with you contained in every single verse father I pray for our tribe fam, as we go on this journey, we're not, it's not going to be long, just a couple of, couple of weeks, as we go on this journey through Psalms 90. Speak to us. Change our hearts and change our lives through this song that came out of a deep cry of Moses' heart that was recorded in Scripture and been available to us. 
Change our lives, Jesus. We ask you. worship you, Lord. We laud and magnify and praise your name. We tell you thank you and that we love you. Father, we've worshiped you through song. We want to worship you by honoring the word that was discussed and preached here today. And Father, we want to worship you by bringing you our tithes and our offerings. Thank you for being our refuge. Thank you for providing relationship for us. And thank you, thank you, thank you for imparting restoration to us. As a way of telling you thank you and that we love you, we bring our tithes and offerings to you today. God, I ask that you would use these finances that come in today, finances that come that have ultimately come from you, but have been wrought and dug out of the earth with the sweat of their brow, the calluses on their hands. Your people bring you a portion of their finances to tell you thank you. We love you and we trust you. God, I ask that as they bring their finances for you, would use these finances to make your name famous here at Tribe, in Jackson Hole, the surrounding region, and to the uttermost bounds of the earth. And God, I ask that in 2022, that you would continue, just as you have done in years past, to provide for every single material and financial need of our tribe family here and everybody that gives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Well, we've talked about the offering. We've prayed over the offering. And you know how most of uh, our tribe family gives. If you're watching the live stream, you can click on that upper right hand corner and you'll see a link to give and you can give one time or set up a reoccurring donation. If you live here in the local community, we have a little black lock box that you can always drop a check or cash off in. Most of our tribe fam is generous through their smartphone. If you open up a new text message to eight, four three two one you can you can make a donation that way and i just want to uh, uh ask that the lord would bless your giving today as far as announcements go we just have uh uh two two announcements the first one is this at the end of january we're going to do a baptism we already a water baptism we already have two people signed up and so at the end of the month we're going to do a baptism if you've never been baptized in water or if you were baptized like as a baby and don't really remember it or it wasn't significant to you and right now the holy spirit's stirring your heart you've invited jesus into your heart to make him the leader of your life that's a very inward and personal decision but as an adult, as a mature person, you haven't been baptized in water, which is an outward sign or a public profession of your faith, send us an email and we will get you on the schedule to get baptized in water. That's thing number one. Thing number two is if you're part of our normal tribe fam and you attend services regularly, we would love for you to pray about doing one of two things or both. Number one is join our uh, hospitality or our host team uh, as we have services and different events here at the TMC on Sunday and on Tuesday we would love for you to help host 
Uh, and that just means pretend like this is your home, get everything ready to have people over and, and welcome and greet people and make people feel like this is their home, which it is. And number two, we have a, a sign up sheet here at the TMC for providing a meal on Tuesday, 6 p.m. So whether you're a great cook or you're really good at ordering food, it don't matter. Tuesdays, 6 p.m., we always have a meal here and we would love for you to sign up to take one of those meals. I think that's all the announcements that we have this week. Yeah. If you're watching, wherever you're watching, would you just stand up for a moment? Let me pray for you. Go ahead, set your Bible down, set your coffee down, stand up and let me pray for you, all right? Lord Jesus, I command a blessing over each and every member of our tribe fam. Thank you so much for taking us by the hand on this journey that Moses went on as through Psalms 90. Just command a blessing over our tribe fam. This week, we pray these things in Jesus' name, the strong son of God, and everybody says, amen. I love you so much. Don't throw your back out shoveling all this snow, but get out there and ski it. Have a great week. I love you, and you got this.